You're good to go. Okay. I want to welcome everyone uh, to the Simsbury Camera Club, Simsbury Public Library Lecture Series. Uh, tonight, we are going to enjoy the uh, presentation from Lee Hoy. And Lee is a North American OM system ambassador, as well as a contributor to the Journal of Wildlife Photography. I, I noted in his um, biography and online that he shot for, with Canon for 25 years before making the switch to OM systems. And after only one year of the system, he was invited to become an OM amb system ambassador in 2019. Uh, his primary role is serving as a senior photography workshop and instructor for wild side nature tours. And that's what Lee is currently on right now. He's starting like a month long series. I'll let him talk about that. And we're talking about tonight, um, the secrets to capturing uh, birds in flight photography. And Lee knows a lot about birds. He's taught beginning birding classes as well as photography classes, Lightroom classes. And he served as an instructor for the Travis Audubon Society in Austin, Williamson Audubon Group in Williamson County, Texas, and many master naturalist classes. And for the Texas Ornithology, Ornith I can't say this, Ornithological Society. And he speaks at many camera clubs and at birding and photography festivals and for OM Systems. And uh, welcome. We're looking forward to the evening with you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Susan. And thank you all for, for having me. I'm, I'm so glad to be here. I always love doing these presentations. Uh, a couple of things before I introduce myself and get rolling. Please feel free to use the chat at any time to ask a question. I try to keep an eye on it while I'm presenting. I don't mind being interrupted. It's not offensive to me. And, and I really enjoy questions. So, and I'm covering a big overarching aspect tonight. So, you know, inevitably there might be some little, very small details that I don't cover. So feel free to ask those, you know, ask camera specific questions, whatever. I'm completely fine with that. I am in a hotel. As you look back behind me, you know, this is not my normal attire. I, I always feel like when I'm a hotel, like, hey, buddy, you want to watch a photography presentation? You know, it always, it feels a little seedy stuff for some reason to do it from a hotel room. But I, I'm on the road about 270 days out of the year. So, you know, I, if I want to do it, I have to do it sometimes from here. Uh, if for some reason audio or something isn't going well, you know, Susan or Linda or Robert, you know, one of y'all, uh, the president, some of y'all just, just chime in and let me know so I can back up or if I need to go over something again, I'm happy to do so. Having said that, looking at this ugly mug, I'm going to share my screen with you. And uh, that way you guys can see my presentation. And if somebody would just pop in the chat and confirm that my window is sharing well, I'd greatly appreciate that. Or if someone would just yeah, that's it. good. No, that's awesome. good. excellent. Okay. okay, thank you, thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> I'll be honest. I love talking about mastering bird and flight photography, and the reason I enjoy that is, I, I think we would all admit that bird and flight photography is incredibly challenging, but it can also be very rewarding. But most photographers really struggle with it. You know, most of my clients when we get out in the field, they they just aren't, they don't have a system for it, which is what I'm going to share with you all tonight is a system for bird and flight photography. But before we jump too much into that, let me let me get my uh, slides going here. And, uh, and hopefully I can tell you a little bit about myself because probably most of you have never heard of me. And again, my name is Lee Hoy. I am an OM system ambassador, and that's an accomplishment I'm extremely proud of. I like I said, it, it, I was only using our gear for a year before they invited me to join. I know a year and a half ago, I was one of the top uh, ambassadors in the world at moving people over to the system because I truly believe in it. I I, I love it. I can teach uh, no matter what camera system you're using. I love to have you join me on workshops, but I am very proud to serve in that role. And I work with Wild Side Nature Tours. Last year, I was in Zimbabwe, Zambia, Brazil, Peru, Costa Rica, Belize, uh, you know, uh, Yellowstone, Grand Teton, I cover a lot, Florida, I cover a lot of different places, and uh, Faroe Islands, oh, that's a beautiful one, and uh, 
And then I do some workshops for Precision Camera and Video out of Austin, Texas. And as she mentioned, I do write for the Journal of Wildlife Photography. It's the only periodical I subscribe to for photography. And I'm really excited to join them. My first article will be coming out in the winter uh, edition. It'll be very detailed. And I, I like the technical side of that journal. If you subscribe, I have an affiliate link on my website. It sure helps me out. I have a lifetime subscription because the benefits are so great. So I um, would love to have you join us over there at the journal. Also, I always like sharing some of the things I've been doing over the past year. One of my favorite trips over the past year was my Brazil Pantanal uh, workshop where we had uh, a pair of Jaguars mating. Uh, we were the only boat there for out of the about two and a half hours we spent, about an hour and a half, our boat was the only one. And there can be a lot of boats in different areas. So I was really happy with some of the images that I came back home uh, from Brazil with. Uh, but uh, really today, what I'm looking forward to is talking about bird and flight photography. So let me give you an outline. Let me go over what I'm going to share with you today. First, we're going to talk about the goals. What is it we're trying to accomplish when we undertake bird and flight photography? We're going to talk about the struggles because the struggles are real, okay? We're going to talk about system number one, which is the subject. So what can we know about our subject that's going to help? System number two, the setting. So we're going to have the subject, the setting. Then we're going to talk about system number three is the light. So a lot of times before we even raise our camera, we're going to be assessing and understanding several things before we even figure out where we're going to photograph from. from. System number four, we'll talk a little bit about autofocus. System number five is going to be the drive mode. System number six, the exposure. System number seven, the composition. And then finally, the success. When we put it all together, what can happen, okay? So I, I like to talk about the goals, or as I call it also, the evolution of the bird in flight photographer. So no, no matter how long you've been photographing, one of the things I love about nature photography, even as a professional, I can always get better. Every day, every year, every outing, I'm striving to be a better photographer than I was the day before, okay? And unfortunately, I, I sense a lot of times in modern America, people want to circumvent the learning process. And they would just, they want to go from bought a camera to getting photographs like I do. I have people go buy camera gear that I use and they think, well, if they stand next to me, they're going to get the same images, but that's just not true. There are a lot of elements that go into capturing a great image. And, you know, with, with some of the advances in technology and post-processing software, people even more in AI, God forbid, uh, you know, they, they, they think they can skip it. And the reality is, is you learn more from your failures than you do your successes, okay? So let's take a look at this, this process of the evolution of the bird and flight photographer. Goal number one, you just hope you can capture a sharp image of a bird in flight. You know, you, you look at the back of your camera, you, you're, you, you're new to photography, and oh my God, there's a bird in flight and it's sharp. Forget the fact that the background's boring, that it's not exposed well, that it's centered in the in the frame, that you're shooting up at it. I mean, nothing else matters. You've got it sharp and you're ecstatic and you feel a little twinge of excitement go through your body, okay? Well, goal number two is a sharp and a properly exposed image of a bird in flight. At this point, you post this on Facebook you know, 800 of your friends think what a phenomenal photographer you are. They don't understand the background's kind of boring. You know, the angle may not be great. You're looking at it going, oh, Nat Geo should be contacting me anytime. You're upset it didn't win a photo contest. But by God, it's, it's properly exposed and it's sharp. And that's all that matters. And I will tell you from my experience, you know, just because an image is sharp and it's properly exposed, that still leaves 90% of those that are probably not very good images. And I'm saying 90% to be generous, okay? Goal number three is we want a sharp, properly exposed, and a well-composed image of a bird in flight. Whether it's random or intentional, you just hope that the composition is good. You may, you may crop post-capture, or you may try to get it correct in camera. Okay, but either way, you've got like, hey, look, you know, this this bird, like here you look at this shot of this Muscovy duck in Brazil. The wing position is nice. The light's nice. The background's pretty nice. Hey, man, at this point, you're convinced that you should go pro your friends and your family. 
you know, are telling you how amazing you are. There's no better photographer, but you've hit goal number three. Okay. Goal number four that we want to move to is a sharp, properly exposed, well-composed, and beautifully lit image of a bird in flight. What's ironic, this Cresta Cara I photographed also in Brazil, none of my clients lifted their camera when I saw this bird above the river. Because in their mind, it's a Cresta Cara Cara. We have those in the United States. Yes, but this was one of the most beautifully backlit Cara Caras I'd seen. You'll notice the detail in the primaries, the secondaries. Look at the spread there of the primaries. The Alula, that little feather that comes off the shoulder of the wing. The primaries are spread equidistance with all the detail coming through didn't blow it out. You have little bugs that are backlit and beautiful against that background. You know, now we're starting to move more towards what I call a visually compelling image. Okay. And goal number five, a sharp, properly exposed, well composed, beautifully lit, and a nice background image of a bird in flight. Now we're getting somewhere. And, and this image is beautiful. The background color happens to contrast lovely with the, with the colors of this drake pintail. You can see water droplets on the belly and falling off the bird as it comes in. The, the head position, the body position is nice. The spread of the primaries is lovely. No feathers are covering the eye. Both feet are visible. The bird's nice and sharp all over and, and it's nice warm light. So all the elements are coming together, right? To help, to help move us towards a visually compelling image. And then goal number six is a sharp, properly exposed, well-composed, beautifully lit, nice background, and a visually compelling image of a bird in flight. You know, this particular image tells a nice story. This is a black skimmer with a Yakara caiman in Brazil. And, you know, the sun is rising, it's backlit, and there's, there's you know, getting these two subjects at this angle is 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 not easy, Right. And I have, a, I have a formula called preparation plus skill times patience equals luck. So preparation plus skill times patience equals luck. And here, there's that element of luck, but that luck occurred because of preparation. Like if you look at my exposure, you can see detail in the skimmer, right? My skill, I mean, I had to follow the bird. I had to get it exposed properly while it's in flight, maintain autofocus, and again, not blow out the highlights, but get detail in the bird, compose it in camera, boom, and, and then capture the image. So that's preparation plus skill. I was patient. I knew every morning where the sun was rising, I would go out to this pond and, and not worry about always going someplace different, okay? So that's the goal we're moving toward is what I would call visually compelling images of birds in flight. But... Can we be honest and talk about the struggles? And you don't, probably don't see this in too many presentations, but I'm going to share some of my crappy shots with you, okay? So the struggles are, as I like to call them, the almost but not quite images. Like this knob-billed duck, my shutter speed's a little slow, so the, the, this picture's not tack sharp. My angle is not good. I'm in a safari vehicle. I would have loved to have been lower. That background's kind of boring. The light is overcast, so it's soft, but it's... It's not a very compelling, I love the head position, I love the wing position, but it just isn't working. I mean, it's okay, but it's not sharp enough. That's a delete on my computer. I wish it weren't, I love those ducks, but that's a delete. So let's talk about some of our other struggles. For example, too often our subject isn't sharp. Now I just posted on my YouTube, a video called Assessing Image Sharpness. Everybody goes, my image isn't sharp, and they don't think about what kind of unsharp it is because depending on why it's not sharp the solution could be different okay for example in this image of whooping cranes ah oh, my image isn't sharp well no my focus grabbed the grass you'll notice there's grass that is tack sharp the whooping cranes are not but the grass is tack sharp there in the foreground that is called missed focus okay that is missed focus that is when something in the image is sharp but not your subject. So if something in the image is sharp, but not the subject, that's missed focus. I will say a lot of my clients will often say, there's something wrong with my camera. Why? My image isn't sharp. Well, can I be honest? When a, when a client is, or someone in the field has told me something's wrong with their camera, 0.03% of the time, there's truly a problem with the camera. The rest of the time, it's user settings, user occurrence, user fault, or whatever. But 
the more you figure out why your image isn't sharp, the better you can come up with a solution, right? Mm -hmm. If if there's been camera movement, everything in the image is blurry, okay? So if you move the camera, mm -hmm. everything should be blurry. If something is sharp, mm -hmm. the problem was a camera movement. Now, camera movement can occur from a couple of things. You mm -hmm. didn't have a good base, you're, you were tired and not hand holding well, your shutter speed wasn't fast enough, lots of different reasons why that could be the case. Wow. All right. Mm -hmm. Insufficient depth of field. Occasionally, your image isn't sharp because your aperture is too large. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're shooting at like f4 when you should have been at f6.3 or 7. Also understand, you may think your aperture isn't isn't deep enough, but if I pulled out the app Photo Pills, which is one of my favorite photography apps that I, I use it a lot, if you look at the depth of field for a long lens, so if I put in my my OM1 camera, if I put in my 150 to 400 lens, which is basically a 300 to 800 f 4.5 uh, with a built a 1.25 teleconverter, so I can get to a thousand millimeters, so uh, equivalent 35 millimeter equivalent. So if I'm shooting at a thousand millimeters, I want a warbler to be about 20 feet away. Now I've already looked at the calculations and at about 20 feet away, my depth of field is less than an inch. It's very narrow. So if autofocus grabs the shoulder and not the eye, odds are the eye will not be tack sharp. So you need to understand when it's truly an insufficient depth of field or when autofocus grabs something other than the eye, okay? Sometimes, and most of the time, the problem is your shutter speed is too slow. The reason, and this is when the background or other objects may be sharp, but not the subject. For example, maybe the bird moved its head and the head is blurry, but the body is tack sharp. And the reason that the majority of the time your, your shutter speed is too slow for the following reasons. You overestimate your ability to handhold your camera. You are afraid of high ISOs because you've listened to Facebook gurus, you know, camera review websites. Oh, I can't stand those things. Um, and 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 by the way, the Facebook gurus are generally men 20 to 45 who think they know everything. And you go look at their images and they all suck, you know, but by God, they're the expert on Facebook. And uh, too many YouTube channel videos that tell you you can't shoot blank at a high ISO. I assure you, I have tons of images on my OM1 at ISO 12,800 and above. I'd be happy to put on a cover of a magazine, blow it up three foot. I project them in presentations, three feet, four feet, no problem. Um, but stop having too slow a shutter speed. And there's other reasons too we'll look at in a minute. Would you rather have a high ISO image that's tack sharp or a low ISO image that's blurry? We, most of you think, well, that's kind of obvious. Well, I had a client with me at Bosky two years ago, and two days after the workshop contacted me and said, hey, what are the dates for next year? I said, oh, you enjoyed it that much? He said, no, I didn't listen to you, and I shot at ISO 800 the whole time, and none of my images are sharp. And I thought, that's a special brand of stupid right there. <laughs> like, I don't know how she described that. Like, I was saying every day, make sure you have a high enough ISO, and I say all the time what I'm shooting at. I guess he just thought I was making crap up, but... That's that's a really special kind of mm, maybe this isn't a good hobby for you kind of moment, you know. So let's talk about that struggle to slow a shutter speed. Here you see that on this uh, juvenile snow goose at Bosky that my, my shutter speed was a little slow, not because the wingtips are blurry. I don't mind that. But the head is just not tack sharp. The body's got a little bit of a wrinkle to it. Right. Why do we have this happen? For a lot of people, I don't. I use manual mode 100 percent of the time. I grew up using a Canon AE-1 with a broken meter. So I did the Sunny F-16 rule. In fact, if you look at the screen, I have the Sunny F-16 rule, the cloudy F-11 tattooed on my uh, forearm to remind me of those rules because I love them. They're part of my history. So I do manual exposure all the time. Aperture priority mode does not work for bird in flights. Now, here's what I hear from occasional photographers. Well, it works okay for me. I'm not here to teach you much of the time or part of the time. Aperture priority does not work for birds in flight, period. And we can go out, I can stand next to you and shoot, and I'll show you why it's wrong, why it doesn't work. But it doesn't work for birds in flight. The owner of Wildside, Kevin Lachlan, he shoots an aperture priority except for birds in flight. I don't know why he shoots an aperture priority the rest of the time. I hate it. I hate everything aperture priority chooses to be. I hate exposure compensation. I don't care if you shoot in it, but I hate it. So, auto ISO. This is another one. Well, it's worked okay for me. I'm going to actually show you a, a series of images 
out of a strip in Brazil. I decided to, I get asked about it so much. I thought, let me just do some experiments because I knew what it would do. So I took between three and 4,000 images using auto ISO. And it had about the consistency you would predict. It sucked. It was awful. It, I, I would never trust it. And by the way, I'll mention I'm a control freak. I'm OCD. Kevin says I'm CDO because I like it should be in alphabetical order. And I want to get it right as much as possible. Auto ISO is terrible. There's one circumstance I may recommend it for a brand new photographer that's trying to learn manual and they're feeling a little overwhelmed. Temporarily go there. But it's going to mess you up a lot. Okay. It's just going to mess you up a lot. Using a shutter speed too slow for specific species. For example, a gray blue heron in flight, when we watch them, you're, it's a miracle they stay in flight when you see how slow they flap their wings. Like if, if any bird was a millennial generation bird, it's a gray blue heron. It's like, ah, I'm only going to do enough effort to find, you know, kind of get me there. Well, the shutter speed here is you might get away with one eight hundredth of a second for a great blue heron. You are not doing that for a peregrine falcon. You probably need to be closer to thirty two hundredth of a second for peregrine falcons. So you need to understand not one shutter speed fits all birds. I tell most people when you're out photographing, try to be at least one twenty five hundredth of a second for bird in flight until you develop that internal database. Okay. You're worried about noise, so you're using too low an ISO. I cannot stress that with the advent of, uh, like I use DxO Pure Raw 3, I own Topaz AI, I've tried the Lightroom AI, and for me, DxO Pure Raw 3 is better than all the others. I've done a bunch of images comparing them. I don't care if you use the other ones, I'm just telling you, I buy software and test it so I can answer people's questions. With, with that, your ISO is meaningless. Exposing to the right is critical, we'll talk about that, but don't worry about your ISO anymore. So let's talk about why our images are not properly exposed because that's another struggle. You're using auto ISO. Do you see that series of images? Look at how variable the exposures are. Now these aren't edited. I know I clipped the bird. I don't care. I was doing an experiment, okay? Look at the variation in exposure. You should see like all 3000 and some images. It, 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 it used ISO is anywhere from 400 to four uh, to, to 8,000. And the light never changed. The light was constant. So in manual exposure, I could meter off a turn, get rid of my highlights, make sure my exposure is spot on. If I see a blackbird, you know, like a cormorant, I know it's about, you know, a stop difference in light, which is three clicks on my shutter speed. And here my exposure changed all the time. And in manual mode, I would change my exposure maybe twice, you know, once for white birds and once for black birds because there's a tonal variation in those. But but this was like drunk, like my camera was drunk. And I'll do I'll be doing this experiment more and showing people because I'm amazed how often I hear from people that auto ISO works well. The only time I've got a spreadsheet going where I measure did it expose to the right? Was it underexposed or overexposed? The only time when it exposed to the right seemed to be a random combination of the background having some dark and some light so that it balanced each other out with this lighting condition. That's not an acceptable hit rate for me. Using aperture priority mode, I can I can go into depth, but it, it does not work for birds in flight, plain and simple. Okay? If you rely on your camera meter, a lot of people think their cameras are very smart. When it comes to exposure, your camera is super stupid. It is only smart when the sun is low in the sky behind you, shining directly on your subject, which we call front light. So in the morning, that's basically the sunny F-16 rule, okay? That's when your camera knows what it's doing. Side lit, back lit, you know, direct light, overcast light. Your camera's an idiot. It's not going to do it well. And I know what people say, oh, well, Lee, what about spot metering? Awesome. If you can keep a spot meter on a common house, Martin, in Pharaoh Island, in the rain, you have a ball. You're the best photographer I know. I'll come learn from you, okay? If you can get a spot meter on a house, Martin, whipping around below you, I'll come learn from you. So, no, it doesn't work. Not using histogram or highlight alerts. I am amazed how many times I say to clients, for those that have it, by the way, I will never own a digital, I'm sorry, a mirrorless camera that does not have live highlight alerts. It's one of the big reasons I left Canon. They were falling way behind in the mirrorless world, and I saw it coming, so I shot Canon, I shot Sony, and what then was Olympus. Now, I shot them all at the same time, 
I shot them all at the same time uh, before I made a decision because I'm I'm just wired that way. Um, and and I know Canon and Nikon they don't have live highlight alerts, and that's one of the best benefits of a mirrorless camera. So I've had I've asked clients, so I don't see your histogram of your highlight alerts. Oh, it was just in the way I turned them off, and I thought. One said, well, I see it all the time, That a bunch of red. I'm like, that means you're always overexposing your images, okay? So those are the two most important tools on your camera for proper exposure. So if you don't have live highlight alerts, you got to pay closer attention to your histogram. And not exposing to the right, okay? Exposing to the right, and I'm going to give you a brief summary of this because we got a lot to talk about tonight. I, I, I see guys on the internet with Sony, ISO invariants. That's mostly night sky photographers talking about it well you can recover the shadows more in a sony okay great it's awesome don't care here's why exposing to the right is still important i want you to think about when you press the shutter button you are not taking a picture you are using a computer to collect a data file a data file that ultimately is comprised of zeros and ones okay so too many people look at the back of their camera to try to assess how good it looks exposure-wise. I don't care how it looks in the back of your camera. doesn't matter. I can look at my highlights and histogram and know if I properly exposed it. I don't even need to see my image. Just let the highlights flash or not, and let me see the histogram, and I'll go, oh, nailed it. I don't need to look at it. Most of my images on the back of my camera, when my clients see it, they say, oh, it looks overexposed. And I go, what are you basing that off? And they go, well, it just looks that way. So here's the thing. In post-processing, if you reduce exposure, you never add noise. If you brighten it, you do. So by exposing to the right, which means we're putting our histogram as far to the right as possible without blowing out the highlights unless the scene or the subject warrants it, okay? So sometimes to properly expose a bird, you may have to blow out the sky. Hint, if you're always doing that, you're probably taking a lot of crappy shots, okay? So... We expose the right because our sensor, think of every pixel as a well, but we're not pouring water into our wells, we're pouring light. And the more light you pour in every pixel, the higher the signal to noise ratio, the cleaner our image will be at any given ISO. So it's about collecting data. It's not about making our image look exactly the way we want it on the back of our camera, because post-processing is where we get our image the way we want it to look. That's important to understand. Yes, in the long run, we end up with an image or a picture, but I need you to think about the fact you are collecting a data file. That's a big distinction. Another struggle is we often end up with poor backgrounds. A lot of people don't realize how to set themselves up for a great background, okay? You're shooting in terrible light. A friend of mine, and I can't remember which photographer said this or I would have credited him, told me most photographers show up too late and they leave too early. And that's true. I see that happen all the time. You end up with an ugly sky. Like I love blue uh, morph snow geese, like this bird here. Great wing position, great head. You know, the light's nice and soft, but the sky is ugly as crap. It's not a great, it's a, it's what I call a field guide image, right? You could identify all the key field marks in that bird, but it's not a visually compelling image. We get busy backgrounds. Oh my gosh, so many photographers don't know how to position themselves to have nice, clean backgrounds. And you don't pay attention for hot spots. Our eye is drawn to hot spots in an image. So if you have a nice section of green, but a big hyper hot spot in the background, people's eyes will often be drawn to that. And you know what? Sometimes if you're shooting on a boat and the person positions a boat a certain way and you want to photograph a certain subject, sometimes you just can't help it. Now, one of my sayings is the biggest difference between a professional photographer and other photographers is we know when to not press the shutter button. I don't care how rare, unusual, unique something is. If I know it's not going to be a good shot, I try not to take the image. Okay. Another thing we run into is poor composition. Like this image of the Sandhill Crane, the bird is too centered. The visual balance is off. It feels like it's tipping to the left. Some people say, well, why not just crop the image? By the way, Probably less than 5% of all my images get cropped at all. I prefer the challenge of shooting in camera the way I want it. And also, if I crop this image, I'm going to lose too much of the background that I really like in this particular image for me. You may be able to crop it and like it. I wouldn't like it as much if I had to crop it. So the bird's too centered here. Whoops, hold on. I went the wrong direction, of course. So the bird can be too far or too far back in the frame, Okay. The bird can be too high or too low in your frame. That will mess up your composition. 
Sometimes we clip the wings or the body can be in a weird position. You know, like at 50 frames per second, my favorite drive mode on my OM1 is SH2. I can shoot it up to ISO 12A. At 50 frames per second, I get a lot of wing and body positions. And sometimes when birds are flapping, their body, their head, their wings can be in really weird positions. Like I never like a, a, a wing position where it looks like a wing is missing. I don't like that. And so, you know, with 50 frames per second, I get more choices on what frame I want to keep. Your visual balance is off. I, I've talked a little bit about visual balance. And this often happens because for many people, they leave their focus point. It's always in the middle. And so is the subject then, okay? Other struggles we might have are acquiring, tracking, and focusing on subjects. You know, here our boat was moving. The Jacana was flying at us. That is not cropped. And I'm shooting at a probably 800 or 1,000 millimeters, you know, and I'm really good. I used to hunt growing up. And, you know, that may offend some of you. I don't care. I'm from Texas. We hunt, you know, and mm -hmm. there's nothing better than food you've got yourself. I'm telling you what. And uh, so acquiring, tracking, and maintaining focus on a subject is easy for me, okay? But what happens is a lot of people are too slow in getting their camera, their lens on their subject. You know, they hold their, they hold their camera down at their lap instead of under their eye, right? So that you just have a short distance to move it. You take your eye off the subject. I see so many clients look down at their camera. They find a subject and they look down at their camera. Worst thing to do, keep your eye on the subject. Move your camera in front of your eye, okay? Don't need to look down at your camera. Look at the subject. And you're shooting too tight or too wide. You know, sometimes you're too, you're too wide and you can't find the bird in the frame. And some people really struggle getting a bird in, in the frame when it's too tight. And what I recommend then is what I call racking the zoom. So you might have it at 100 millimeters, you know, and then you might rack out to 400 once you acquire the bird. And that way it might help you, you know, if you had a little struggle. I tend to just keep it where I want it and zoom. I, I tend to keep it 1,000 millimeters. I love shooting tight. I like that challenge, okay? But for some people, that's hard getting it in the, the, the viewfinder. Too many people have a, don't have knowledge on the subject flight style behavior. My article coming up, I think in the, in the spring issue of the Journal of Wildlife Photography is about subject flight styles because it varies from family, bird family to bird family. And the more you know how birds take off, lift off, maintain flight, the more prepared you are to keep them in the, in the viewfinder. A lot of people have, they're unable to follow the bird after they get it acquired in the viewfinder initially. You know, swallows often bank on a, on a whim. People often don't pay attention to wind direction and things like that. And then a lot of times it's due to improper autofocus settings. The reason I have a job is I love reading owner's manual. Most people don't like doing that. And then a big improper expectation on your autofocus. No, your camera's probably not going to do a good job when you're shooting at 500 millimeters trying to get a warbler a hundred feet away. And you say, oh, this camera doesn't work well. I'm gonna say, mm, the photographer doesn't work well. That's an unrealistic expectation, okay? So let's jump into system number one. We talked about the goals and the struggles. Let's get right into our, our, our uh, understanding the subject. For example, this flight, I know how blue-footed boobies fly when they're fishing and how they'll turn upright and dive. So I know how to follow them, how to, I, I set myself up to have the beach in the background, knowing that where the birds start hunting, they often hunt in that area for a little while, okay? Mm. This is one of the most important things to learn. Birds perch, they take off, and they land facing into the wind. So if you walk out of your hotel room, your house, your RV, whatever, and you know what direction the sun is coming up at the location you're heading to, but you know the wind direction is not going to be in your favor. OK, then don't even go to that spot to begin with. Uh, I often I have a spot on the central Texas coast I really enjoy. And the sun will often be coming up kind of off to my left. Right. So if birds take off into that and if the wind direction is coming the same direction as the sun. Right. I'm, I'm going to be having butt shots or butt landings. I don't want to go there. OK, I don't want to do that. I, I want to get, I want, or, or I've got to go further down the beach to where the beach curves and that'll work for me. Okay. So knowing that will give you a big uh, help in getting you positioned. If, if there's very little wind, the way you know which direction the wind is, look at what direction the birds are facing. 
whether they're perched on the on the on the ground, on a telephone pole, a fence, they are going to perch into the wind so they can get a quick takeoff. Another one is, and some of y'all probably know this, raptors often defecate before taking flight, right? So here I had this American kestrel sitting on some uh, Mormon tea out near where I live. And right before the bird leaned forward, fired it off. And I told my clients, get your camera ready and got several pictures of the bird leaping into flight and taking off. You got to know that ducks, geese, and cranes fly out early to forage. At Bosque del Apache and Bernardo, I see all the time people that show up too late not realizing the birds have already flown out for the day. Well, we're, we're, when's the takeoff? Well, you missed it by about 40 minutes. I hope you had a great breakfast, you know? <laughs> Sorry. We don't understand predator-prey interactions like this. Uh, this is a northern goshawk flying into a flock of starlings in Newfoundland. I wish it had a better background. It's a cool shot because of the predator-prey interaction. I, I'm not a big fan. The background's okay, you know? But... What happened was I saw all these starlings take off and start banking. And I thought, oh, you know, there's got to be, a, there's going to be a raptor around here. If all of a sudden you're, you're out on mud flats and every shorebird lights up and the skimmers and the gulls, you can either choose to shoot that, which is pretty cool, or you can start looking for the raptor. You know, either way, it's going to work for you. Understanding parasitic behavior. So, you know, in the Galapagos, you see Prince Philip steps there on, uh, on uh, Isla uh, Genovesa. And uh, I talk about, you know, luck. I see this frigate bird start coming down out. Of, and when they start dropping, I know they're going after a bird with food. And I tried calling out to my clients, hey, we got predator behavior going on here, parasitic behavior. And I must have 10, 12 images of this frigate bird literally grabbing and upending the, the red-billed tropic bird here as it's trying to get it to disgorge its, disgorge its meal, which it eventually does. But I love this particular shot because it's in front of an iconic spot in the Galapagos Islands. The bird is literally being upended by the frigate bird. I had to nail my exposure. It's overcast. So in order to, to, to maintain, not blow out the white on the, on the tropic bird and have detail on the black bird, I'd be spot on with my highlight alerts. But I know that if I see a frigate bird that's just soaring, soaring, all of a sudden you see it start going down quick, I'm going to follow that thing because I can't wait to see what it's going after. Then you got to learn to group birds by flight speed. You know, I was in Zimbabwe and I had an awesome local guide, uh, King Richard, man. And there was hardly anybody around. I go in the wet season when there's not that many folks. And I said, hey, can I hop out and get eye level where these vultures were coming in on natural death uh, wildebeest? And he said, sure, sure, sure. So here I'm, I'm at the ground eye level, but I know I have more time to work with because A, the birds are flying at me. So it means I don't need as fast a shutter speed. And B, I know vultures aren't going that quick anyways. And this is not crop. This is how I shot it vertical and nice and tight. So you can see the detail on this, on this uh, vulture. And if you learn flight styles by family, I, uh, this is a uh, uh, kicker rock in, um, Galapagos, and I wanted a, a shot of a blue footed booby flying in front of it. And I saw that there were some out hunting a ways away. And I set up on the rock, and knowing their flight style, I knew if I could find one that was about the right elevation further away, I could I could follow it to this and start shooting before it got there and follow through. Ended up with this awesome. I love the shot because it's right in the crack of Kicker Rock, and I love the bird angle, the wing position, the light it works really well but it's because I know flight styles that I knew I could follow that bird. I heard a sound. Was it, did somebody have a question? No. Okay. All right. So here I'm going to talk about the setting system number two, and this is a video. I, th I think it'll play okay here. And I want you to watch me here on the left-hand side. And I want you to figure out what's going on. You may be able to hear it. You may not, but watch what's going on in this video. Now, what you can tell is the wind is ungodly strong, and I'm standing near the edge of, I don't know, a hundred foot or higher cliff. You'll notice the other photographers are knelt down. I'm standing. Uh, yeah, the photographer there grabbed my hat to get it out of the way. Why did I set up right there with this crazy wind, 
Why did I, I mean, you can see how much I'm buffeting from the wind, right? But it was because I'd read my my setting. I knew the cliff, I knew the wind direction, and I knew that nor Northern full Mars were gonna be coming around that cliff. They nested on that cliff ahead. And the reason I set up right there is because I wanted shots like these two. So the, the one on the left, you see the flowers, you see one of the, one of the birds, uh, you see a nesting cavity in the lower right the lichens on the rock and that cool wing position from the full mar as it's kiting into that heavy wind. Now, I, while I generally don't like just a water or sky background that much, I like the water background on the bird on the right. It contrasts nicely with the full mar's uh, body colors, you know, the tonality of that that kind of works for me. I wish the right wing was a little more out and it's missing a primary that it's molting. But other than that, I really like that image. So that's why I was set up there. I read the setting and wanted to shoot, really trying to get birds with the cliff behind them, okay? And the other photographers that were a little nervous about standing close to the edge, they put themselves at a disadvantage because you couldn't you couldn't quite shoot with the, with the cliff in the background, but they were probably a little more concerned about falling off the cliff. So the setting, let's talk about setting the stage, okay? first thing you do when you walk up to an area, you want to read the wind direction. I've already mentioned that a couple of times. This shot of this Arctic turn was in the Faroe Islands, same place you saw the video. And when I walked up to this cliff, we probably had, I don't know, half a mile cliff to work with. But I noticed at this one spot that on the left, the, the cliff curved out. And where the shadow fell upon the ocean, it gave it this dark gray background in appearance. So that is shadow on a, on the ocean. Directly in front of me, I could get, and, and that and if I shot to the left with that background, I got this bit of backlight, which made this Arctic turn look beautiful. Directly in front of me, I would get front light on puffins and other birds flying up with a deep blue ocean. And to the right, I had more of a pure front light with even lighting on the background and I could get grass and flowers or I could get uh, a less blue, a, not as quite a saturated blue ocean. Okay. So I read the wind direction. I knew the birds would be coming up the cliff and over. Sometimes they went to the left. Sometimes they went to the right. Sometimes they would come up in front and bank. So I knew where I was standing was the best spot for the light and the wind. You've got to learn to read light quality and quantity and direction so light quality is about good or bad light light quantity is how much you know night sky and then there's low light and then there's moderate light there's bright light there's dapple light there's overcast light so there's all these different qualities of light quantity just tells you how much okay so you got to learn to read the difference just because you have a lot of light that may not be a good image right? And just because you have low light doesn't mean it'll be a bad image. And then you want to learn to really pay attention to, to light direction. I see so many photographers, they get out of the car, they walk up to the spot that's nearest their car, and they just start looking for subjects. They're, they're, they're putting the cart before the horse. Where am I going to capture great images? And then let me go there, and then hope subjects come to where I'm going to capture great images. Watch your position. Okay, I'm going to give you an example of that here in a minute. Prospecting potential backgrounds, potential autofocus pitfalls, and secure footing. Let's take a look at these, okay? So, for example, following the wind direction, we were in the Galapagos, and we're on uh, Santa Fe Island. That's where this picture is taken. Kevin Lachlan, owner, owner of Wildside, took this. The wind was the strongest I've ever had on the island, and for most of it, my clients were hunched over, head down, hurtling forward which I don't know why you want to rush just to get back to the boat because on the boat's nothing but boat. I'm like, guys, we need to slow down. Let's take advantage of this wind. Why? Well, most of the time, the Galapagos shearwaters are 100 feet down or so below you coursing in the wind over the water. And you can get some okay straight down shots. But the beauty of this wind was such that as it came over the edge, the shearwaters were coming up these cracks in the cliff. You see one in front of me. And all that beautiful red, orange, yellowish susuvium is a succulent that turns this color uh, during the, the guara season when we go. 
and the birds would come up the cliff. And then when they turned, they were going into the wind. So they would hang, making autofocus and, and images of them easier than ever. Because normally they're hauling butt down below you. So, and here, if you're standing where I was standing, you could get them against the red background. How many of my clients, now, by the way, on the Galapagos Islands, we take four, up to 14 clients because we can get seven people on each Zodiac. This shouldn't be a trick question. How many of the clients do you see in the image with me? Zero. That would be correct because they're to the right, heads hunkered down, cameras lowered. This was one of my greatest opportunities for photographing this species, and we hardly got to spend any time there, okay? So one of the things I, I find is great and cha challenging weather conditions can produce phenomenal images. Don't, don't mistake that, right? Great weather condition. I mean, uh, bad weather conditions can produce great images. You just have to know when and learn to read that. Okay. Again, like quality, quantity, and direction here, this full Mars coming out of shade so the cliff behind it has shadow, and it has this nice soft light hitting it. Some of the photographers that were with me, we were on a scout trip. They wanted to go further down to get closer to the birds. But I said, if you go too much further down, your background won't be the dark cliff. It'll be the, the ocean out behind it. And I love that light that looks like the birds are coming out of the shadow. Okay. So uh, another one about watching your position. Okay. Sometimes closer isn't always better. For example, here in this image, you'll see a puffin, uh, Atlantic puffin, flying along. The, the, you see the burrow in the background. They nest there, and it's flying along the cliff. And I was standing, there's a big gap in the, the oceans in front of us. We're at the cliff edge. There's a big gap of the ocean, and then there's the, the nesting cliff. Well, we started out as close as we could, and I realized the background was too close. When the birds came out of the burrows, they dropped down too quick. And I thought, you know what? I know what I'm going to do, okay? Now, you see the rest of our group there. This was a, a, a scouting trip. So, you know, three of the people in there are professional photographers and others are friends that just got invited along with one of the other photographers there. Look how far back I am from them. In fact, this is a video, and I want you to watch the local guy from Scotland. Watch what he does to me, and he looks back wondering why I'm back where I am. See, so he's like, what are you doing back there, right? So they're all sitting at the cliff edge. You can see the green up there where the where the puffins burrow, okay, where they nest. Here's why I backed up. When I backed up, I could get the birds actually coming into a little bit of backlight, overcast backlight. They were further from the background. I'd have a dark background, and you see how the wings and everything's outlined real nice there. So the, the beauty by backing up is I actually put myself in a better position because when burrows, when puffins come out of the burrows, they drop, okay? So I gave myself, the birds would come by right almost at eye level. Where, where When we were up at the edge, the birds were up higher. So right off the bat, I created a much better image simply by moving further away. I want you to always be thinking about your backgrounds. Here in Brazil, we have this beautiful tree um, called the uh, Ipip. Oh, gosh, I always forget the name of that. Ipip, or uh, I can't remember the name of it. Some of them are yellow, some are pink. And these hyacinth macaws were sitting on top of this uh, perch out there. Just They were actually eating guano out of the the uh, end of the stump because vultures roost up there, which was doesn't sound like a very appealing appetizer. But... Some of my clients want to go to shoot head on. I said, oh, you'll just have sky. You can go shoot that, but just know you're not going to have that tree there, right? So always looking at your background. You also need to be watching for potential autofocus pitfalls. One of the things I've noticed, um, you know, other animals, like in this case, I don't really like this image. It shows how well my autofocus stayed on my subject. But all of those birds were potential autofocus pitfalls. And by moving 20, 30 feet to our left, there were no other puffins sitting there, and then we could get them as they flew around the edge of the cliff. Okay. Now, this is where I was standing in contrast with the others in the group. Notice I moved back, but you'll notice I'm on some really rough, slippery rocks. You don't really see it, but just to my right, a couple of feet is about a 30-foot cliff. You know, you really want to be careful uh, when, you're, when you're doing bird and flight photography. One of the things I really recommend 
is making sure your footing is very secure. A, you'll notice I'm not, uh, I'm kind of standing in a shooting position, right? That helps you have a better, more secure footing because your safety comes first and then helping you capture better images. All right. Oops. All right. System number three, the light. So when we were standing at that cliff edge, I caught this image. This is Eurasian oyster catcher. And I don't know how well you can see it, but there's actually a couple of jellyfish in the water. So as the bird came into that gap, I knew that looking down, we would have overcast light. And I love the dorsal service surface of oyster catchers, that black and white, that beautiful red bill on the Eurasian oyster catcher. But I had to make sure I exposed properly. Otherwise, if I underexposed, the black of the bird was going to blend in with the with the water, right? And if I blew up the whites, there'd be no detail on it. So this is another example why you really want to nail your exposure. But learning to read light is system number three. By the way, each of these systems you can work on every time you go out. You can focus on just one. You don't have to try to do it all. So I designed this so it would be incrementally you could see improvements in your photography every time you go out. You're not going to remember all this at once, okay? But every time you go out, try to put some aspect of it into practice. I want to tell you, light is more than happenstance, okay? I want you to start thinking about how can you orient yourself for the light you want. Here's that same tree in Brazil, except this is the pink one. And the sun was coming up. It hadn't broken the horizon. And this large bill turn came flying by. I wanted the tree in the background with that, with the nice kind of orangey light from the from the, the the sun coming up, which it was giving kind of a pinkish hue right now. And what I noticed was, you know, if I just stood there and waited for a bird to come by, I'll get a great shot. So rather than moving myself, I, I oriented myself for the light I wanted, and then I just waited for a bird to come by. All right. Another thing uh, to learn about is the circadian rhythm of natural light. And we're going to take a quick look at that. Learning to read and chase natural light. So again, orient yourself. Here I'm at Quiddivity Lake in Newfoundland. And there were locals were feeding the gulls and the ducks. Well, I had this beautiful stormy light. Now, I love a dark sky like this against warm light coming from behind me. And... This old boy came up to feed the gulls, and I said, hey, bud, would you mind standing right over here to feed them? And that way, it would put them in a position where I could photograph them as they came in. So I oriented myself and the little kid for the light that I wanted, right? Rather than shooting back into the sun, I wanted that dark, stormy sky and just said, hey, bud, do you mind standing over there? And I gave him a couple of bucks afterward to buy more food for the gulls and ducks. I told him, thank you very much. I really appreciate your help today. Now, let's talk about the circadian rhythm of natural light. Now, nighttime is when the sun is technically at 18 degrees below the horizon. Uh, you're not doing any bird and flight photography then. Astronomical twilight, minus 18 to minus 12 degrees. You're not doing any bird and flight then, but it's a good time to get in the field, okay, and be in place because you can do silhouettes. In the next one, you can do other things. So... I like, I generally like to get on the scene. Sometimes I'm there at night, depends on where I'm at. Sometimes I'm there at astronomical twilight, getting set up, hoping for some good opportunities. Okay. So nautical twilight, the sun is between minus 12 and minus six. You're going to be shooting very high ISO, most likely silhouettes, but you can start getting some shots. Civil twilight, now we're cooking. Minus six to zero. You'll have, you'll go from a, a blue sky to sometimes orange and reds, again, silhouettes, or you can start using high ISO to get some good exposures. Blue hour, the sun is between minus six and minus four. That's when that sky is blue, and you can get some really cool looking stuff. Now, golden hour is when the sun is between minus four and six degrees. If you own the Photo Pills app, this will tell you all the detail you want to know. Because where you're at, based on your latitude, the, the duration of each of these varies tremendously. I've been in places where golden hour might be 15 minutes. I've been there when it's over an hour, okay? And then sunrise is when the sun breaks the horizon. And then daytime is when the sun gets above six degrees. If there are no clouds and I'm by myself, I'm often done by 8.30, 9 a.m., particularly if I'm in the tropics. Now, when I have clients, we'll shoot longer because, you know, they're not going to get to go back. They want to be out more. I get that. 
But this past trip in Brazil, I had four days by myself before clients arrived because I went straight from the Galapagos. I would get up, I'd be out at about 6 a.m., a little bit before sunrise, you know, getting into that that astronomical twilight time. And I was done by 8.30, you know. I was done by 8.30, easy. And then I didn't go out until 3.30, and I was done around 6 p.m. So, you know, because I was paying attention to this light. Now, if it's overcast and soft light all day, yeah, I'll be out longer. So let's talk about the different types of light. There's dapple light. Dapple light can be very challenging to photograph in, but it can produce some very cool images. It can produce some god-awful images, but if you play it right, like this hummingbird coming into the light, I noticed I was doing high-speed flash photography in my backyard. And what I did was I saw this bird coming in and out of the shadow. I just reached up, flipped off my flash um, trigger, and I focused to the right and waited for this bird to come back into the light. There's overcast light. This is in the Galapagos. I like overcast light. Look at all the detail in the bird's plumage. This At this time of day, if the sun were out, that would be a terrible shot based on the sun's position and other elements. That would not have been a good shot. But because it was overcast, no problem. Occasionally, harsh overhead light works to your advantage. Here's a cliff at Española Island where the birds are often flying against the ocean below us. So direct or harsh overhead light lights up their dorsal, dorsal surface. Ugh, easy for me to say. Dorsal surface lights it up evenly, and then you get that nice color in the ocean behind it. So here's one where harsh light. Now, if this bird's eye level, the harsh shadows, it's probably not going to work that well. So we stay there for a while while the light gets a little, goes down a little bit too, so we get both. Harsh reflected light, back to Newfoundland, look how the light is being reflected off the water, like almost serving as a reflector, and it's illuminating the bottom of this ring build goal, okay? So I have a catch light in the eye, you know, the feet are just touching the surface, and even though the light's harsh, I really like this image. And here's your standard front warm light. The sun's low in the sky behind me, snail kite flew down to Brazil, grabbed it, uh, an apple kite, and heading up to a perch to eat it. Easy exposure, nice warm light, always visually appealing generally. Haze light, this was in Peru on our Amazon Riverboat Workshop. You know, it was weird. It was almost like you were in some kind of an apocalyptic movie. This is not a black and white image. This is color. The sky looked like a volcano had erupted and it was that way for much of the morning, but it produced this great almost silhouette looking shot even though that's truly black and white, okay? Very weird light. You don't see it a lot, but don't doesn't mean you can't shoot in it. Side light, you know, uh, the Nakunda Nighthawk, one of the largest nighthawks in the world, they will they'll whip around this one spot. When you walk along, you don't if you don't see them, they might pop up and fly. And I wanted a side lit one with those cool trees in the background. And sure enough, this guy popped up and I got him coming. I, I aimed to the right and just boom, as he came at me, Beautiful, beautiful balance there between the light and the shadow on this bird. Backlit, also another shot in the Galapagos here where we've got light coming through the wings, giving you that nice distinction from the background. Rim lighting is beautiful. It can give you some awesome bird and flight shots, okay? And then emerging into the light. This is a little different than dappled. Um, these uh, tropic birds were nesting in a hole in the rocks, and as they come shooting out, they come out of the shade into the light. And so it's related to, to dapple light, but where I am, it's not dappled. It just happens to be going from harsh shadow to bright light. And then you can use an on or off camera flash setup. You know, I actually shot this with a black background, um, and the humming the hummingbird is actually trying to sting the the I mean the bees trying to sting the hummingbird here. I'm I won't enter this into a contest because it doesn't have a natural background, but I like it with the black acrylic background there. Now let's talk a little bit about autofocus. Okay, um, <clears throat> there's more to it than you think. What is continuous autofocus? What is tracking autofocus? What is subject detection AI? What is autofocus point areas? What are additional autofocus settings we need to pay attention to? And then troubleshooting. So continuous autofocus is when means if I'm holding the, the, the focus button down and whether you use the shutter button or back button focus, I like back button focus. As long as you're holding it down, it means it's continuously trying to autofocus. That's what continuous autofocus is. 
What is tracking autofocus? Tracking autofocus means it's going to try to predict where the subject is going, okay? Now where we're at is subject detection AI. You know, Sony, Nikon, Canon, OM, they call it different things, right? But it's basically using AI to, to identify birds or mammals or planes, trains, whatever, right? So subject detection means it's trying to look for a subject, which means if your bird is so small in the frame, it can't hardly tell there's something there, it's probably not going to work very well, okay? It also means if you have eye detection set and the bird looks away, you should let off of autofocus for a second, okay? Because it's not seeing the eye. I'm talking more about perch birds and birds that are on the ground or whatever. The next question you have to ask is, should I be using a single point, groups, or all? For birds in flight, most of the time, I'm using all autofocus points because I want the autofocus point closest to the eye or the subject to start first. If I'm shooting subjects coming in flight and in front of me, like I was at Bernardo the other day and I had a lot of corn stalks up in front of me, you know, I didn't want autofocus grabbing that. So I created custom rows of autofocus points at the top of the screen so that it would work on subject detection at the top and not at the bottom. Okay. And then there are additional autofocus settings that can mess you up, like center priority. Like if you, when you are shooting at a higher ISO, did you know that sometimes that limits your autofocus functions? You know, some of the most important parts of your owner's manuals are the uh, footnotes at the bottom. Okay. So paying attention to that will really help you a lot. Autofocus troubleshooting. So often people don't know what's going on. When you pick your camera, when you pick your lens and camera out of your camera bag, always check your, your, your buttons on the side for your autofocus limiter for manual or autofocus, right? Sometimes you hit those. And so often people pick it up. My camera won't focus. Well, take a minute, check that out, see what's going on. Now let's talk about the drive mode. I don't have a lot to say here, but a couple of important things. You need to know your options. Your drive mode basically comes down to frames per second, okay? Faster is not always better. Sometimes faster drive modes put limitations on other features. And those limitations can be found in the footnotes in your owner's manual. What is electronic shutter versus mechanical shutter? Let's take a look. Frames per second. I love shooting at the fastest possible frames per second that gives me continuous autofocus in between every image, gives me raw files, okay? Just because your camera does up to 120 frames per second, that might only be in JPEG, might not allow for continuous autofocus, right? It might freeze it at the first frame. That's not going to work for me. Like this shot of a swallow about to grab a bug, you know, thank God I was shooting at 50 frames per second because the gap... I had one frame of a bug in front of it and nothing else had to do with the predation event. Faster is not always better. For example, I love 50 frames per second on my camera, but if I need to be above ISO 12.8, I can't use that. I have to drop 20 frames per second, which yielded this result right here. And then now Nikon's come up with global shutter, which no longer has the electronic shutter distortion that you see in this image. With the OM system, we don't have a global shutter. Most of the time, I did some experimenting. Most of the time when you get this distortion, I don't generally find it would be a pleasing wing position anyways. But if you're using an electronic shutter, very high moving subjects, primarily hummingbird speed like, you'll get these weird distortions. But if you have a shoot Nikon, that's no longer an issue. I, I think all the other camera manufacturers will get there. Just know that's a potential. Let's talk about exposure. I always like to teach you how to get it right in camera, okay? So we're going to talk again briefly about ETTR. Not much because I already covered it. Histograms and live highlight alerts, manual exposure for the wind, shutter speeds, apertures, and ISOs. So one question I like to ask is, is this image properly exposed? Okay. I hear this a lot. Yes, it is. Now, does that mean how it's how I would want the final image? No, but here's the histogram. I'm in the develop module, so you can see I didn't blow out any highlights. Well, when we're shooting in certain situations, you want to make sure your histogram and your live highlight alerts are on, because here you can see on this eagle the detail in the tail, the detail in the body. I had to be spot on with live highlight alerts. I could be. 
Okay. Manual exposure that, you know, I don't normally like to shoot like up into the sky, looking at the bottom of a golden eagle. It's a great field guide shot because I can see all the detail, but your camera would never expose this properly. This is probably two and a thirds stops over exposed per the camera meter. Obviously it's spot on for the image, but the camera would never get this correct. That's why you have to be in manual exposure. Again, I want you to work on developing that internal database for the shutter speeds and what's going to work. And then most of the time for aperture, I'm shooting wide open to F8. Now, this is a trick. It's it's F14 because I'm doing high-speed hummingbirds. So I threw a little image in there that's a trick for you. And then this image is at ISO 6400. Don't worry about going so low. Here in the Amazon, the light was very low, but this black, show, black colored hawk came out. Make sure you start with a sharp shot. Properly exposed, you'll be just fine. Now let's cover composition system number seven. And let's talk about the creative elements. So we have rules of composition. We have negative space, visual balance, angles, head and wing position, flocks, breaking the rules, great backgrounds, cropping for composition, vertical versus horizontal, and environmental flight shots. So here's a standard rule of third shot. And even though it follows a rule of composition well, it's not the most exciting image. Okay, the background's okay, the light's okay, you know, subject's good, but it's still a rule of thirds image, right? Yes, there's rules for a reason. Yes, you can break them sometimes, but you need to know why you're breaking them because it generally doesn't work when it's just broken on accident. Negative space. Now, here's a, a great horned owl flying with a blue sky. I share it because, you know what, you don't get great horned owls flying during the day that much. This is a wild bird in Big Bend. And But notice there's more negative space in front of the bird than behind it. Almost most of the time you want your animal to have more negative space in front than in the rear. Okay, I'm, Yeah, more negative. We want the bird moving into the negative space. We want good visual balance. Here, these little Elliott storm petrels provide nice visual balance to the frigate bird. They're not overlapping. You know, the image doesn't seem like it's going to tip left or right because of the size of the subject on the left versus the size of the additional subjects on the right. Angles. I love this head on angle of this kestrel. It was snowy. So I got kind of a plain white background, which is okay. I like this shot because I love the angle. It makes you feel like you're the prey. And head and wing positions. Again, look through a series of images and ask yourself, which one is more visually appealing to you? Your definition of what's more visually appealing might be a little bit different than mine, and that's okay. That's where our art, that subjective nature comes in. I love this. The, I like eye contact. I got a little eye contact peeking over the wing. The primaries are spread nicely. The feet are down. The background's great. Flocks of birds, just because an image of a flock of birds is sharp or there's a lot of birds doesn't make it necessarily a good shot. You need a visual anchor. And in this image, the bird in the upper right rule of thirds provides that anchor. If I overlaid this with the uh, golden spiral, you would see that it follows the golden spiral perfectly. And then breaking the rules. This pelican at the front is not flying into the negative space. But it works because your eye goes to the pelican and it follows the lines of snorkelers behind it. So you still have good use of leading lines. The sky's a little boring. You know, that one bird flying in the background adds a little bit to it. I wish there were some more birds in the sky in the background on that shot. And sometimes the birds in flight are the great backgrounds. You know, this was that hazy day in Peru. And even though my main subject isn't in flight, the birds in flight are the background. And every now and then you're going to crop for composition. This is a panoramic crop that way. These are four different birds. It's not a composite. But, um, you know, I, I I cropped it because the sky was just a plain blue and didn't contribute to the image. John asked, do you prefer left to right over right to left movement in the final image? Or does it make no difference? You know what, John? I got asked this question in a prior presentation. And here's what I think. I think because we read left to right, we generally uh, prefer images, birds flying left to right. But notice this image and many others, the birds are going right to left. I suspect down deep, I have a bias for left to right. That's my gut feeling. So I think, I think 
a visually compelling image can be either. But I bet if we actually went back and assessed our images, we eat, we probably have a bias. I bet because we read left or right that that's our, our unconscious bias, subconscious. Vertical versus horizontal. Most people never shoot vertical bird, vertical bird flight shots. This is shot vertical. It's not cropped. It's crazy. I mean, I got a greater re in the background jumping up to grab fruit off a tree and a cocoy heron, cocoy heron in flight in front of it. Now, had I shot it horizontal, could I have cropped it? Yes, but then I'm throwing away half my image. Here, I'm not throwing away any data, right? And then environmental flight shots, man. Don't not. I love shooting tight, but not always. I love this background in the Galapagos Islands. The cliff and the Scalesia trees really add to this particular image, I think. Now, what happens when it all comes together? Well, success, right? What you hope for. You know, maybe you get a, uh, a, a, a ringed kingfisher taking off in flight, you know, in Costa Rica. You know, maybe you get a black colored hawk grabbing a piranha, you know, in Brazil, backlit with water trailing off the back, right? Black and white, harsh light. I love this shot, even though the light's harsh. I shoot in black and white intentionally. I love black and white wildlife. I love the other birds in the background here. I love the vertical shot. You know, it was obviously shooting very tight, but I love the way this image came out. You know, nailing the exposure helped provide detail on the bottom of this frigate bird that's pulling a Galapagos shearwater out of the surf. If I had underexposed that, that would be a terrible picture. You brighten it, there'd be a ton of noise on that frigate bird. How about this? When when hyacinth macaws fly by and there's greater rears in the background, by being patient, standing in that one area and, and following the birds along and trying to put them in the frame where I wanted them, boom, you get shots like that, right? How about a bee in front of a hummingbird? Or a sandhill crane with the moon? Or another... You're in the pharaohs and it's puffing after puffing coming in and you're just having a blast shooting them. I, I hope you guys have learned a lot. I know I covered a lot in this presentation. Here are some destinations. If you want to work on mastering bird and flight photography, I'll be doing an OM only one in Florida. I think I only have one space left for that. I'll be doing one through Precision Camera on the Texas coast. Um, I go to Zimbabwe and Zambia again in January 2025. Costa Rica. I'm going to Cuba. I have a couple of spots left for that. The Amazon Riverboat Cruise. We've got a few spaces left for that coming up in February. So I'd love to have you join me out in the field, particularly mastering birds in flight. You're going to see me doing more and more of those. And then um, I do an OM system mentorship program. If you shoot OM, follow that website. I'll be starting the next group late in 2024. And uh, if you'd like to follow me on social media, there's my Facebook, my Instagram, my YouTube. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I'd be happy to take some questions and I'm going to stop sharing my screen there so you guys can uh, hop on the chat or hop on video. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, thank I, you, Susan. Sure. I took, I took notes, but. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, Susan, you know what I'll do? I should have said this at the beginning. When I have time, I will send your club a PDF of the presentation because I know I have to go faster. So forget trying to write it all down. <laughs> uh, that way your club can download it. I ask that y'all not share it or make it publicly available on the website, but that way you can provide it to your club members for their own personal use. Right. Okay? Thank you. Lee, you mentioned black and white. Are you capturing in black and white or are you converting in post-process? No. Uh, and the reason you'd ever want to capture in black and white is when you do that, you were leaving a ton of data on the table. Yep. So it would it would eliminate your color data, which when you go into, uh, I use Silver Effects Pro for black and white conversion, mm -hmm. which is way better than Lightroom for black and white. You're mm -hmm. going to often turn those colors into different tones. And if you get rid of that data to start with, you don't have it. So I yep. shoot thinking black and white, yep. but I always capture in full color. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, good question, Kevin. Excellent presentation. Thank yeah, you so good. much. Awesome. Thank entertaining you. as well, I must say. <laughs> good, good, good. I'm glad. I'm through it. Thank you. Good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, you bet. And I think we had a record number of attendees. Oh, awesome. Great. Yeah. Great. Great. Good. 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 But no more Can questions. We, I inundated you with information. Yes, you did. 
<laughs> hey, Lee. Yes. Um, I think you had said in the beginning about the wildlife, uh, Journal of Wildlife Photography that you have an affiliate link on your website. Is that on there? Or I was looking for it and yes. I didn't see it. So on my website, on the lower left, on the front, you'll see like OM System Ambassador. You'll see the Journal of Wildlife Photography logo there on the lower left. Oh. Um, you get monthly, you get access to free monthly trainings. I've done uh, a more detailed presentation on composition of bird and flight photography. Russell Graves, a friend of mine who works with Wildside, he's doing a presentation about shooting contest-worthy shots coming up. Uh, Elise Bender does for Wildside. She's been on there. Lots of great presentations. They have photo contests every month that pay a lot of money. So it's a really great resource, huge online community. You get access to all the back uh, issues. The lifetime subscription is absolutely stellar for that thing. Yeah, okay. I, I see it now. I was looking at my phone, but I went on my computer and I see it. Thank oh, you. Oh, sure. Sure. Yep. Okay. Okay. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, it was, this was awesome. Thank you. Good. 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 Lee. Good Lee, one, uh, one question. Early in the uh, presentation, you said uh, don't use auto ISO. And and I sort of grabbed one point from that because of ink, the camera will provide inconsistent results, I believe is what you said. Were there others, other reasons? So it's going to, again, my light was constant and it messed up horribly, right? I anticipate I gave it conditions where it would succeed fairly well. And its performance was in terms of exposing the right is probably less than 5% of all the images. So it's going to constantly move your exposure based on like I went in manual mode and turned auto ISO on. So I locked my shutter speed and my aperture, meaning I gave it an even better chance for success. If you went to auto ISO in aperture priority or God forbid using shutter priority, um, it's going to do even worse. So exposing the right collecting data, it only performed that randomly based on the tonality of the background. And it, it's not going to give you consistent proper exposures. Whereas I know manual exposure mode can be intimidating for some, but with modern mirrorless cameras, it's never been easier with live highlight alerts and live histograms, okay? So, um, you know, there's so much more I could go into exposure. I, I do have a, a presentation on my website called the Nervous Nature, on my YouTube channel, called the Nervous Nature Photographer's Guide to Shooting at High ISO. And I'd recommend watching that because I talk a little more in depth about exposing to the right and why that's so important. And you're just, I know, I know for a lot of people, they think, oh, but. But how often do you change ISO? Well, if the light's not changing, I never change it. I rarely change my aperture. When I'm doing birds in flight, it's normally 5.6 to 8. That's not that much. So it's my shutter speed that I'm changing most of the time, right? So I really don't adjust. My, now, if I'm, in, if, in, if I'm in the Amazon on a partly cloudy day, you know, and we're going and the, and the you know, tributary is curving. Yeah, the light might change some and I may be making adjustments to ISO, but it's because I'm looking ahead anticipating and I set up where the image will be best. So I don't worry about shooting everywhere. Too many people want to try to take a picture everywhere in any light condition all the time. That's going to drive you crazy no matter what. I look for where I think I'm going to capture the best image. I set my settings and I wait for a subject to come there. That's that patience part of the equivalent, right? If you're a birder and you're photographing, it's even harder because they want to photograph everything. <laughs> I do, I don't I don't worry about photographing everything. <laughs> yeah, birders make birders. I say this: birders create the most frustrating conditions for themselves in photography because they don't think about the light condition. They don't think they just want a picture of a bird, right? They just want to be able to identify it or have it, you know, collect it like a thimble. I don't do that. I'm a bird photographer. I'm not a rare bird photographer. I'm not a first time I've seen a photographer. I will photograph a house sparrow in beautiful conditions. I don't care. Mm -hmm. So learning to set yourself up for success will go a long ways. If you follow the system, you'll do that. You'll do that. Most of my clients are photographing the Galapagos Shearwaters down below them. And it's brutal. It's hard. I get shots of it, but it is tough. When those birds were coming up and turning, if they could have just learned to deal with a little bit of wind, they would have walked away with probably some of the best shots of shearwaters that any of my clients ever have. But they 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 couldn't understand that that was the actual 
setting that was giving them the advantage. Well, they said, well, my lens is moving. Yeah, so make sure you have a super high shutter speed and relax your arms every now and then when you need to. So what, you know? Thank you. <laughs> and one other, one other question. So the modern cameras, mirrorless and probably others as well, have a lot of, uh, you know, on the, on the dials, you, you know, you have aperture priority, your shutter priority, and then you have your custom modes. Are you set up so that, uh, geez, I'm going to do birds in flight, so I go to C1, or I'm going to do uh, still birds, so I go to C2. Do you have custom modes set up for I, your preferences? I do. So I have two bodies. I usually have three. I haven't added the third one yet. But every, not only do I use all four custom modes on each camera, I program some of my buttons differently from, so my landscape, some of my landscape buttons are programmed differently than my wildlife buttons. So I keep track of all that because I shoot a lot. My macro will be different, you know, because I'll do, I'll do focus stacking and I'll put them on different buttons depending on what I'm going to use. Like my, since I don't use exposure compensation on my wildlife custom mode, I use the exposure compensation button for turning subject detection on and off. I don't have the settings I use for birds in flight and normal birds are the same. Okay. Yes. 50 frames per second. It's a lot of birds perched, but using photo mechanic, I can go through 10,000 images in half an hour and I'll probably delete. I delete a ton of images that most people would keep, but I don't need 10,000 images. I'm looking for what you're going to see is half a percent of my images. Now, a lot of my images, a lot of people will be very happy with, but I'm not. I'm a perfectionist. I drive myself nuts, right? So um, you can understand that the that for my settings are going to vary based on the function, you know, landscape, macro with flash, macro without flash, night sky, um, high-speed hummingbird and insect flash photography and wildlife. And then I have a wildlife with a wide-angle lens custom mode. So I program all of those differently. I sure do. Sure do. Thank you, Lee. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Lee, I, I take it from your, um, from your, all your images and your videos that you uh, uh, always hand hold. Is there any situation where you would use a monopod or is that a an absolute no-no so ironically enough when i shot canon you know, i had the giant canon 600 millimeter version two i shot with a tripod 95 percent of the time okay mm -hmm. i cannot tell you the last time i remember shooting on a tripod for wildlife with my own system so my big that 150 to 400 i should have gotten that out of my camera case that would have been smart um I have tested, everybody should do this and develop an internal database. I have handheld at a thousand millimeters, no wind and the bird wasn't moving at one fourth of a second. I have eight stops of image stabilization. Now, do I shoot that way normally? No, but I know what I can get away with. What I can get away with and what Linda can get away with are not the same. I'm Scotch Irish. We're built like a mule. You've never heard of a famous Scottish marathoner, but you see Scots throw telephone poles for their games, right? So I can handhold a long time compared to Linda. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, um, and I love that flexibility. It's one of the other reasons I went to OM System. If you need a monopod to help you get better shots, absolutely you should. I have a great one. I use the Photo Pro. Um, I have the Photo Pro E6L tripod. It's not cheap. I don't know why people buy $10,000 worth of equipment and a $100 tripod. That's a whole nother rant podcast I've done and video. Um, you know, so my tripod's about a $1,200, $1,300 tripod. But if I'm going to put $12,000 worth of gear, by God, it better be a good tripod, right? So... I, I, if I'm sitting in a blind doing high speed hummingbird, I might use a uh, tripod just because I'm, I might be doing it for three or four hours to get my arms a break. If I'm shooting in a blind, I may have it nearby just to get my arm a break after a couple hours if the light's being good, you know. But most of the time, I don't need it anymore. I don't, I don't. But that doesn't mean some clients don't. But no, I love that flexibility. I've shot wide angle at two and a half seconds tack sharp with my own system. I have a friend that's done 10 seconds. I've just never tried to get that long, but yeah, it's possible. That's incredible. I know. Yeah, yeah. Oh my Lord. 
Yeah. Yeah. Now that's for landscape. I wanted a blurry waterfall and I uh, used the built-in live neutral density filter and it was a place that you couldn't, they wouldn't allow tripods. So I leaned up against a rail and I, and I took probably 20 pictures at two and a half seconds. So you're like, what? You know, and two and a half seconds seems very fast. It's not when you're taking a picture. Mm. Right. Wow. Well, and John Straub, you're the waterfall guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to thank you again. Um, this has been wonderful. Good, um, good. As Linda pointed out, you you drew a crowd. Right. Yes, uh, you did. And so good. that that's fantastic. Uh, very much appreciated. So yes. Well, thank you all for having me. Hope some of y'all will come join me in the field sometime. Well, thank you, Lee. It was an excellent much. presentation. Thank yep. you. Have right. a good, um, right. good night. I'm guys. assuming if good I join everyone. you, if good I join night, you, you let me use your 100 to 400 with the built-in uh, <laughs> 1.25. For a second, for a second. For my yeah, Olympus camera second. that I have. Yeah. All right, <laughs> it's a second. deal. Sure, sure. Okay. Bye, everybody. Good night, everyone.